Tony didn't get to come back to the Pizzaplex on his own until Sunday afternoon. Between Friday afternoon and Sunday, he'd either been with Raven Boots or he'd been doing odd jobs for his grandma or her neighbours. Boots' dad insisted Sundays were family time, so Tony and his friends never got together on Sundays. Tony usually spent Sunday afternoons with his mom. They played board games or went on long walks together. Today though, his mom wasn't feeling good and she wanted to take a, to take a nap. Tony was sorry she felt bad, but it was good for him. It gave him time to head back to the Pizzaplex while he knew his friends weren't there. Tony wasn't sure what Rab did on Sundays. Tony had never asked him and Rab had never said. Sunday afternoons were busy times at the Fazcade, and all the games were in use when Tony arrived. That was fine. He didn't want to play any games. He was on a mission. The big crowd drawn to the arcade on Sundays. Uh, because that was when the animatronics often strolled through the arcade, joking around and performing impromptu routines, raised the odds of finding either Axel or someone else who might have seen GGY play. Tony eased himself into the throng of players, backing out of the way when Montgomery Gator suddenly appeared and did a little breakdance in the middle of the aisle, he thought about just picking someone at random to ask about GGY. If you guys remember, there was that um, teaser image or teaser uh, animation that was Monty, Montgomery Gator, as like a toy version that was doing a breakdance. <laughs> so that's like a reference to that, which is funny. I love that. Um... That, however, was probably a total waste of time. It sounded like Axel was more of a sure thing. So, Tony decided to walk through the arcade in search of the ugly green hat and long face, small mouth and big ears. For the first time, Tony wondered if the girls had been messing with him. Their description of Axel was a little out there. If the guy really fit that description, he was pretty funny looking. And he was. It only took Tony 10 minutes to find Axel, who looked exactly as the pinball queens had described. The guy was truly unique looking. Axel Brandon Campbell was learning the was leaning onto the game machine's controls on the Bunbarians. That's the one with the um with what people think uh is Ralpho. Um I personally don't think it's Ralpho, but Hey, fair enough. Um, his uh, ugly green, or army green, bucket hat was perched atop stringy brown hair that trailed down the back of a long neck, red and bumpy, with angry acne. Hanging back behind Axel, Tony watched the game screen. Axel was doing a great job of controlling the game's heroes, little axe throwing bonbons. The bonbons drove their army tanks expertly through a dark, mottled landscape that looked like it was made of chocolate. Lifting his gaze from the play, Tony checked out the high scores roster on the game. ABC held the third highest spot. Two other sets of initials familiar to Tony were ahead of Axel. GGY obviously hadn't played this game. Uh, sorry, two other sets of initials unfamiliar, not familiar. Um, guessing that Axel was probably one of those intense players who would get angry if he was interrupted, Tony waited until Axel lost the game he was playing before stepping up beside the stranger looking teen. Then, before Axel could put another token in the machine, Tony said, That was impressive. You're really good at this game. Axel whipped his head toward Tony so quickly that the bucket hat nearly flew off. Axel reached up to tug the hat down more firmly on his head. He scowled at Tony. Tony tried to look friendly. He gestured at the high scores roster. I've seen your initials in other games too. Which game is your favourite? What's your deal? Axel said. Tony frowned. My, my deal? I, I don't have a deal. Sure you do, Axel said. You wouldn't be talking to me if you didn't have a deal. Since that was true, Tony shrugged and decided to just launch into it. Okay, okay, he said. I'm trying to find out who GGY is. The person whose scores are so much higher than anyone else's on several games in the Fazcade. And I was told that you might know. Who told you? Axel asked. Tony shrugged again. I don't know the names, but their initials are KXT and CRF. Two girls, one a redhead and one with a long black braid. Ah, Kenzie and Crystal, Axel said. Couple of stuck-up snobs. Tony decided to try to get on Axel's good side. Yeah, I got that feeling. But are they, are they right? Do, do you know who GGY is? A couple of little girls started looking at the Bunbarians. I'm not done playing, Axel growled at them. The little girls stuck their tongues out at him and scampered off. 
Axel leaned back against the gamer's console like he owned it. He crossed his arms and shook his head. Nah, I don't know who Gigi Y is. He rubbed a pointy chin and narrowed his eyes. But the, high but the guy's scores are too high. Way too high. That's what I thought, Tony said. I asked around. No one has seen him play, Axel said. Scores like that. You think he'd want the limelight, you know? Tony nodded, even though he didn't think every player wanted to be noticed like Axel did. You'd think someone would have seen them play, Tony agreed. It's gotta be a him, Axel said. Tony disagreed, but he kept his opinion to himself. Guy's like a ghost, Axel said. Apparently done with the subject, Axel rotated away from Tony and stuck a, a token into the Bunbarians. He started manipulating the game's joystick. Well, thanks, Tony said. Axel grunted and kept playing. Tony pivoted and surveyed the clamorous arcade. Although a few clusters of kids roamed the aisles, some joking around with some arguing about which game to play next, nearly everyone else in the Fazcade was playing games. No one looked particularly approachable. Not that unapproachable people would stop Tony. He just wasn't sure how much he was going to get out of talking to random people. If Axel, a frequent player who kept a keen eye on the high scores rosters, didn't know who GGY was, what were the odds that someone else would know? But Tony had to do something. No way was he going to just give up. Tony spun around abruptly, intending to walk through the arcade until he felt the urge to talk to someone, and he walked right into one of the Pizzaplex employees. Bouncing off the substantial chest of a stocky, long-haired Fazcade attendant, Tony cartwheeled his arms to keep his balance. His efforts were failing him, and he was starting to tip backward when the attendant reached out and grabbed the front of Tony's green corroderie uh, shirt. Well there, dude, the attendant said in a laid-back, drawn-out lazy tone of someone kicked back in a hammock. Sorry about that. The attendant jerked uh, Tony into an upright position, then grasped Tony's arms to steady him. The guy's hands were strong, and Tony felt like a little kid when the guy gave Tony's shoulder a pat. You good? The attendant asked. Tony nodded. Sorry, that was my fault. I wasn't watching where I was going. The attendant, his name tag said the name was Finbar, laughed. Hey, a polite kid. That's a nice change of pace. He patted Tony's shoulder again. Tony pointed at the black printed name on the yellow plastic card, pinned to the lapel of the red Pizzaplex employee shirt. Finbar, Tony said. Isn't that an Irish name? Hey, how about that? Finbar said. Polite and not at all me, me, me. Finbar cocked his head. Yep, means fair haired. Finbar pointed at his dirty blonde hair. My mum said I was tow-headed when I was born, or toe-headed, sorry, toe-headed when I was born. My mum's 100% Irish from County Cork. I don't know how to do an Irish accent. <laughs> I can do Scottish, but I can't do Irish. Um, my mum's 100% Irish from County Cork. Met my dad when he was travelling the world. According to my mum, Finbar was Cork's patron saint. Tony nodded. Yeah. And in Irish folklore, he was the king of the fairies. Finbar raised an unruly, dark eyebrow that didn't match his lighter hair. Impressive. I wrote a story about how folklore has created some of our society's customs, Tony said. This guy's a nerd. He's like 12 and he's a nerd. A trio of little brown-haired girls with thousands of freckles among them came skipping down the aisle. Finbar took Tony's elbow and pulled him off to the side, near a token dispenser. You're a pretty interesting little dude. Finbar said. I saw you wandering around staring at people. I've been keeping an eye on you. Thought something weird was up with you or something. Or something? Tony grinned. Finbar laughed. <laughs> I can see that. A few feet away, a pigtailed girl Tony recognised from school. Her name was Amelia, and he didn't like her at all. Started kicking a fruity maze game machine. You did not just do that, she screamed at it. Freaking fruity maze mini game game machine! <laughs> oh my god! I forgot this was even in the book. Oh my gosh, this... It, it gets better and better. Tails just gets better and better. Oh, wow. Oh, wow, wow, wow. The game let out a sprightly chortle as if it knew it had just gotten the better of her. Then it bleeped 
and the You Lost music blasted from the game's speakers. Excuse me, Finbar said to Tony. He stepped away from Tony and walked over to the little girl. Hey there, princess, Finbar said to the strawberry blonde girl dressed in all black. The hair and the clothes didn't go together at all, Tony thought. You break it, your mama and daddy gotta buy it, and they won't be happy with you. <laughs> the girl looked up at Finbar and growled at him. I'm not a princess, you jerk, and you're lying! She kicked the machine again. Finbar shrugged. Have it your way. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a walkie-talkie. As Finbar raised the walkie to his mouth, it jostled the keycard hanging on a lanyard around his thick neck. PC on F... L... <laughs> Let me start again. PC on F, level 2, aisle 7, he said in his mellow drool. The little girl was kicking the machine again. Finbar pulled out a key ring heavy with a couple dozen keys. He unlocked the game's control box and powered it off. You can't do that! The, pr the girl screamed. Finbar shrugged. Pretty sure I just hid. Tony grinned. The girl saw him and shrieked. And what are you looking at, weirdo? <laughs> uh, Tony shrugged. He didn't stop grinning. Finbar turned and winked one of his heavy lidded green eyes at Tony. Tony's grin widened. The girl whirled to face Finbar, and Tony was pretty sure she was going to kick Finbar too. Before she could, a tall middle-aged Pizzaplex security guard came around the corner. He looked at Finbar. Finbar nodded toward the girl. Come on, miss, the guard said. Let's go. <laughs> the girl started to argue, but then she sighed theatrically and crossed her arms. Throwing Fin Finbar and Tony dirty looks, she marched off ahead of the security guard who turned back and rolled his eyes at Finbar. Living the dream, the guard muttered. Finbar shook his head, and his wavy hair flopped over his forehead. Finbar flipped his hair back. Tony could tell Finbar had made that move thousands of times. Okay, where were we? Finbar asked as he stepped back over to Tony. Good question, Tony thought. Why was he still standing here? Because Finbar was the guy he needed to talk to, Tony realised. His intuition often gave him hits like that. The reason I've been walking around, oh sorry, wandering around, Tony said, is that I've been trying to find out who GGY is. GGY is the highest score on at least a dozen machines in this place, Finbar finished. Tony's eyes widened. Uh, yeah, exactly. I noticed that the scores were way higher than they should be possible. Finbar took over again. Tony nodded. I noticed it a couple days ago. I'm doing a story and I thought finding out who he was and figuring out how he did it would be a good subject. Finbar nodded. He pointed at Tony's chest. So, what's your name? T -t Tarbell? Tony had started to give his real name, but he had to get used to using Tarbell for a couple of weeks. T Tarbell? Finbar pulled his chin inward and raised one eyebrow. Just Tarbell. Tony shrugged. My friends and I use pen names when we're working on a story, and I chose Tarbell. My name starts with a T, and I almost use that. Um, Finbar nodded. Got it. Good name. Ida Tarbell was an important muckraker at the turn of the last century. It was Tony's turn to complete a sentence. Finbar laughed. Okay, Tarbell, I need to keep an eye on this zoo. Walk with me. Finbar motioned with his chin for Tony to follow him, and together they began striding through the Fauscade. As they went, Finbar pointed at a few machines, mostly pinball machines, but a few other arcade games as well. I'm very aware of GGY, Finbar said. Not sure what any of the other arcade attendants are. Most of them just dial it in, you know? Put in their hours and get back to their lives. Me, I figure if I'm gonna do something, I might as well do it, and not just go through the motions, you know? Tony thought that kind of consciousness didn't fit with Finbar's relaxed manner, but the judging books by their covers saying was true in more ways than one. Since Tony liked to be conscious, uh, too, he nodded. I do, yes. I've got a buddy who's one of the tech guys here, Finbar went on. I asked him to run diagnostics on the machines GGY scored so high on. I was sure the dude, or dudette, hacked the machines. But my guy says the machines are as they should be. He couldn't find any trace of a hack. But how? Tony began. Does GGY get such high scores? Finbar finished. And how come no one, Tony started again, has seen them do it? Good question. It's a mystery. GGY is flying way under the radar. Tony gave Finbar a look. 
Finbar shook his head. Sorry, finishing people's sentences. Is a bad habit, Tony jumped in. Finbar laughed. Tony smiled. So, you think GGY is sneaking in and playing after hours somehow? Finbar shook his head. One of these. He picked up his keycard and fluttered it in front of his well-muscled chest. Gets you access to employees-only areas. But if an employee loses a card, it's immediately deactivated. You'd be able to use it once or twice, if that. And this card doesn't get you in and out of the building. Only security badges do that. And those are even more closely guarded. Sometimes my fellow workers get careless with these things. He toyed with his keycard again. But anyone who steals one won't get to use it for long. Finbar frowned and looked over Tony's shoulder. Sorry, he said. Got another issue to take care of. Finbar gave Tony another pat as he walked past Tony. I'll see you round, he called back as he started to hurry away. Let me know if you solve the mystery. Tony watched Finbar wade into a fight that was developing between a couple of ski wall players. Then Tony sighed and turned to walk away. Finbar had been nice, but he hadn't been all that helpful. All Tony had learned was that GGY wasn't hacking the game machines. Maybe. Just because the tech guy couldn't find evidence of a hack didn't mean a hack hadn't taken place. Some hackers were just that good. Tony really wanted to talk to more people, but he couldn't. Not today. If Tony didn't get home soon, his grandma would come and drag him home. Missing his grand's Sunday dinner was a big no-no. Tony started heading out of the arcade. Tony had almost reached the Fazcade's second story exit when an anguished squeal distracted him. He turned and saw a skinny girl with wild hair shaking her fist at one of the pinball machines. The girl was maybe a year or two older than Tony, a round-shouldered boy a few inches shorter than the girl, but probably about the same age, was watching her with wide eyes. That was my best game ever, the girl whined. I just blew PB P P PDB out of the water, she pointed at the machine's high scores roster. See? But I'm still nowhere near GGY. How does she do it? How do you know GGY is a she, Dana? He asked. Dana turned and rolled her eyes at the boy. Seriously, Wes, do you think a boy could be that good? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Feminism. Uh, she made the word boy sound like what she really meant was gross, slimy slug. Excuse me, Tony said. I couldn't help but overhear you talking about GGY is. Uh, who, about GGY. Do you know who GGY is? Dana turned and threw all the force of her narrow-eyed glare at Tony. What's it to you? Why is everyone so rude in here? <laughs> Genuinely, I, like, there hasn't been a nice person apart from Finbar. And he works there. Tony tried to look harmless. I've noticed GGY's high scores is all, and I've been curious. He pointed at the new second place initials on the Pinball's machine roster. That's a great score you just got, he said. It seems like GGY's score should be impossible. Dana's face relaxed just a bit. Yeah, that's what I keep saying, she nudged Wes. Don't I keep saying that? Wes nodded. She keeps saying that. Dana punched Wes's upper arm. Ow! He protested, rubbing the spot she'd hit. Dana studied Tony for a second. What do you know about Gregory? Oh, <laughs> GGY, <laughs> she asked. Tony shook his head. Not much. When Dana looked like she was losing interest in him, she, he added, but I just found out from one of the attendants that they ran diagnostics on the machines that list GGY as the high scorer, and the machines haven't been hacked. Dana's brows lifted. Well, that's interesting. I was wondering about that. A friend and I were chatting about it online yesterday. She thought GGY was hacking. Dana shook her head. Guess not. She tapped her foot and scowled at the pinball machine's high scorer's roster. It's weird. You'd think someone that good would be in the forums or something. She shrugged and pulled a couple tokens out of her pocket. She turned back to the machine. Tony had been dismissed. He turned away from Dana and Wes and started to walk through the Fazcade exit. After a couple of steps, though, a flash of glowing white caught Tony's eye. He looked to his left and he felt faltered. He was being watched by one of the animatronics. Tony looked up into the gleaming white eyes of the big orange animatronic bear with the red armoured shoulder pads and the black top hat Glamrock Freddy. Thinking that Freddy was just being friendly, the way the animatronics were during their Sunday stroll around, Tony lifted a hand and waved at the bear. Freddy, however, 
didn't return the gesture. He just kept his intense gaze on Tony, as if sizing Tony up. Suddenly chilled for reasons he didn't understand at all, Tony looked away from Freddy and hurried on. After a few more steps, Tony glanced over his shoulder. Glamrock Freddy was still watching him. Goosebumps popped up on Tony's bare arms as he practically ran out of the Fazcade. By the time Tony made it home that Sunday afternoon, he'd gotten over the weird freakout he'd had over Glamrock Freddy. He didn't understand why the animatronic had gotten to him. He'd never found the robotic character scary before. But then, none of them had ever looked directly at him before. Maybe that was it. Maybe Tony had just gotten the heebie-jeebies because he wasn't used to making eye contact with a robot. Whatever, Tony didn't care about the weird encounter. He was too wrapped up in the mystery of GGY. Throughout the week, Next, uh, throughout the next week, every evening after he did his homework, Tony tried to find out more about GGY. He didn't make any progress, though, until he got to thinking about what Dana had said about forums. When he remembered her comment, Tony realised that maybe if he visited a bunch of sites, he might be able to find GG that, GGY that way. Over the next three nights, Tony dove down the rabbit hole of forums for top arcade gamers. Creating a username, Digger1, <laughs> I get it, I get it. It's like digging into the mystery, but I'm just thinking of like a large mechanical um, like vehicle digger. Uh, creating a username, Digger1, and a password for over a dozen sites, Tony asked the same question in every forum he, he visited. Does anyone know all the high scorers at the Pizzaplex? He figured asking that way would obscure his real interest in GGY. For some reason, Tony had a feeling he shouldn't be up uh, too upfront about what he was after in these forums. When Tony didn't get any helpful answers to his question, he went back to just hanging out in the forums. But the hours he spent online got him nothing. Until Thursday evening. That was when Morrigan99 confronted him. Ooh. I'm pretty sure Morrigan is Irish too? Is that Irish mythology? It could be. I don't know. Morrigan, like, that that sounds very Irish to me. Mor Morrigan? M-O-R-R-I-G-A-N. Anyway, sitting cross-legged on his sagging twin bed, Tony's old bed had been double with a memory foam mattress, which he missed very much. Tony was hunched over his laptop, as he had been for several hours over the previous three evenings. It was nearly 10pm. Tony's room, like the rest of the house tonight, smelled like the sausage and cabbage his grandma had made for dinner. Even the open window, through which Tony could hear a soft rainfall pattering on the old house's metal roof, didn't take away the stench. Tony was discouraged by the lack of progress in his investigation. He was about to log out of the forum he was currently in when he saw that he'd received a private message. He clicked on it. Morrigan99. Why are you asking about people? A little prickle of anticipation tickled the nape of Tony's neck as his fingers hovered over his keyboard. He debated. Should he be coy or straightforward? Something told Tony to be straight. He tapped the keys. Digger 1. Curious about GGY. Tony waited a full minute before Morrigan 99's answering PM popped up onto his screen. Morrigan 99. Will PM you tomorrow night in the other forum I'm in? Same time. Tony typed quickly. Digger 1. What do you know? Tony waited again. This time, Morrigan99 didn't respond. Tony frowned and tried to remember which of the other forums he'd been in when he'd noticed the Morrigan99 username. He was pretty sure he knew which one it was, but he wasn't positive. Well, he'd try them all if he had to. Tony closed his laptop and leaned back onto his pillows. What did Morrigan99 know? Maybe nothing, but he'd keep the date to and find out. In the meantime though, Tony had another plan. He planned, oh sorry, he decided on it while he'd been choking down his grandma's sausage and cabbage. Thinking back to his conversation with Th Finbar while he'd been eating, Tony had begun to wonder if the Pizzaplex might have some record of GGY, some record that Finbar didn't know about. How could Tony find that out? Easy, he'd thought as he washed down the last of his sausage with a big gulp of milk. He just had to get into one of the employee kiosks. Those kiosks, a few of which were positioned in various locations around the Pizzaplex, 
were like many employee workstations. The previous afternoon, Tony had passed one of them and seen an employee exit the kiosk without logging off the kiosk's computer. If Tony could get into a kiosk right after something like that happened, he could poke around the Pizzaplex's records. Now, as Tony stowed his laptop on the small maple desk tucked into the corner of his almost closet-sized room, he pondered his next moves while he got ready for bed. Thinking about what he needed to do filled his stomach with agitated butterflies, but he was going to do it anyway. Although Finbar hadn't had much information about GGY, his discussion of the way the Pizzaplex keycards and security badges worked had given Tony his idea. What Tony needed to do now was find one of those uh, careless employees Finbar had talked about and get his hands on a keycard. He was pretty sure he could do that easily. Earlier in the school year, Tony and his friends had written a story about a gang of pickpockets. Tony had come up with the idea after, these, after he'd read a, a newspaper article sorry, about a rash of pickpocketing in the town square. He'd wanted to do an expose on the subject, investigating the ins and outs of how pickpocketing worked. He hadn't been able to do that because Mrs. Sosa had insisted on fiction, but Tony had done all the research. He was pretty sure he could pull off lifting a Pizzaplex employee's keycard. Hey, uh, <laughs> just saying, Tony. Just saying, Tony, you, you could make video essays. <laughs> you could make video essays, get loads of views, and get money that way. <laughs> Sound like you'd be very good at it, you know? You're into non-fiction non stuff, you ask the deep questions. You'd be great at it, honestly. I can help you edit. <laughs> He'd do it tomorrow afternoon. It would be a Friday afternoon, and Boots and Rab would definitely want to go to the Pizzaplex. They never cared when Tony wandered off. He should have plenty of time to lift a card, get into a kiosk with an active computer screen, and poke around the Pizzaplex records. Tony slid into his bed. He took a deep breath and blew it out. He could do it. Tomorrow. Um, why is my book not loading anymore? Oh, I it's loaded, but it's a different... Okay, there we go. Sorry. Um, the key to a good pickpocket lift. Tony had learned when he'd researched the subject was distraction. That's actually true. You, deception is is a very fine thing where you, where you're like, uh, uh, it's the classic saying of like, um, in order to steal someone's watch, you have to tell them that you're stealing their phone because they'll be wary that they that like they'll be thinking about their phone constantly in their pocket. They'll be like, okay, my phone's in my pocket. My phone's in my pocket. I'm gonna see if he like tries and touches my pocket or like. Trying tries to go into my pocket or whatever, but meanwhile the pickpocket has has stolen my watch. <laughs> you know, so the best way to steal someone's watch is to tell them that you're stealing their phone. And I I really like that. I I think that's really cool. Um. Anyway, when combined with compassion, distraction was nearly a foolproof way to get whatever you wanted off a mark. Or so Tony had read, and it worked. Having left Boots and Rab in the Fazcade battening it out on a skee-ball machine, Tony went out to the main lobby of the Pizzaplex and began scoping out of the employees' kiosks. The first two he checked out were empty, but he could see the log-on screen in the computer monitors, so he moved on. The third kiosk he peeked into had an active screen. And there, just a few feet away, a Pizzaplex employee was giving directions to a large family. The employee, a dark-haired young woman with a flat-top haircut, was red-faced as she tried to talk to a dad with three screaming children tugging on his pants legs. When the family finally walked away, the woman ran a hand through her hair and blew out air. Tony knew the timing was perfect. Quickly striding forward as if, to, uh, ab as if about to pass the employee, Tony deliberately scuffed his shoe into the lobby's black-and-white floor tiles. He purposefully stumbled forward and fell down. The Pizzaplex employee immediately rushed forward. She bent over Tony. Distraction. Check. Oh my goodness, the woman, her name tag read, Kathy, said, Are you okay? Compassion. Check. Tony made a big deal of rubbing his knee, and he, crump uh, he crumpled his face as if in pain. Um, I think so, he said. Kathy extended a hand. Let me help you up. Tony took the hand, and as Kathy pulled him up off the floor, he used his other hand to snag her keycard off her lanyard, he made sure to wince and moan as he made the move. Kathy, who had very kind brown eyes that made Tony feel ashamed of what he was doing, was so focused on Tony's apparent pain that she didn't notice her keycard disappearing into Tony's pocket. Tony hid his triumph and continued with his elaborate play acting. <laughs> Pickpocket 100. Um, where does it hurt? 
Cathy asked. Is it your knee? Tony, now wanting to get away from Cathy as fast as possible, kept his face contorted like he was hurting as he got to his feet. He brushed himself off and pretended to test his knee. It seems to be fine, he said. I, it just smarted there for a second. Serves me right. I was being clumsy. You sure you're okay? Cathy asked. Tony's gaze, directed by guilt, wanted to go to Cathy's empty lanyard. I just need to walk it off, he said quietly. Really, I'm fine. Thanks for your help. How is Tony going to get away from Cathy? He may not have much time. She could notice the missing lanyard any minute. Luck helped Tony out. Miss! <laughs> an elderly man w called out. Could you help me? I don't know how to do an old man voice. I'm fine, Tony said. Again, go on. Thanks. Cathy frowned. Then she nodded and strode toward the old man. Tony didn't waste any time, taking advantage of the million... Oh, the milling crowds and the cheers that accompanied a nearby animatronic rock band performance. The glam rock animatronics were blasting a song from a makeshift stage set up in the lobby. Tony dashed around to the back of the kiosk. Using Cathy's keycard, he let himself inside. The employee kiosk was small and square, like a little toll booth. Three of the kiosk's pale yellow sides were half walls topped by windows. The fourth side was solid, and it was covered by a cork bulletin board crammed with employee notices. In front of the bulletin board, a large flat screen monitor sat above a small shelf which contained a keyboard. Cords ran from the flat screen down under the shelf into the floor. Tony assumed those were the hard wires that linked the flat screen with the Pizzaplex's main computers. Because the kiosks had observation windows, Tony knew he had to stay out of sight. He'd already thought this through, hoping that the keyboard had a long cord, or better yet, was cordless. Tony grabbed the keyboard. Score! It was cordless. Tony squatted down below the level of the windows, and he started tapping on the, pizza, uh, on the keyboard's keys quickly, poking around the Pizzaplex records. Following the plan that he'd come up with the night before, Tony rapidly scrolled through the databases, looking for GGY. He didn't know which database, if any, might contain a record of GGY, so he had to try several of them. Again, he got lucky. He found GGY in the fifth database base he found, or he tried. Tony sucked in his breath when he spotted GGY on a list of issued Pizzaplex play passes. Clicking on the play pass in question, Tony frowned. Tony wasn't a hacker, but he was reasonably good on the computer. Because of that, he was able to easily spot that the play pass issued to GGY had been modified. Although play passes were supposed to be designed to simply give frequent players access to all games without the need of tokens, this one had been modified into more of a security badge than a play pass. <coughs> Sorry, that was a really long sentence. <coughs> and there's so many P's. <laughs> Pizzaplex pay... Oh, for goodness sake. Pizzaplex play passes were relatively simple white cards with a barcode. The card issued to GGY, according to the computer, had more than just the usual barcode. It also had the semi-transparent Fazbear Company logo that security badges had, and it had a magnetic strip. Tony was sure that with this card, GGY could get into employee-only areas that they wanted. Tony squinted up at the screen. He wished he had a better angle on it. Next to the hacked play pass was a list of three names. It looked like GGY had used the pass to get other people into the Pizzaplex after closing. Tony strained to see the names. Maybe they might lead him to GGY. Craning his neck, Tony saw the name Mary on the screen, but he couldn't see her last name. He could only make out the first three letters of the next two names. Ray something and Trey something. Or T-R-E. Tree. Tree or Trey. Um... Tony started to raise up a little higher so he could see more. A scrape outside the kiosk door startled Tony. He glanced up to his right and saw the back of a Pizzaplex employee right outside the observation window. Tony quickly backed out of the play pass database and he returned to the keyboard to its position on the little shelf under the computer monitor. Keeping his gaze on the red shirted back just outside the window, Tony crab walked to the kiosk door and eased it open. Exhaling in relief because no one was looking his way, Tony quickly stood, tossing Kathy's keycard behind him as he pulled the door closed, and ducked into the nearby crowd. Tony started making his way back to the Fazcade. As he went, he thought about what he'd just discovered. Clearly, Tony thought, GGY was not just an amazing game player. They were also a proficient hacker, 
a very proficient hacker. But why did GGY want access to the behind the scenes areas in the pizza plex? What were they up to? Tony was chewing on these questions as he walked. Because of this, he was paying very little attention to his surroundings until he once again caught a glimmer of white out of the corner of his eye. Remembering what had happened the last time he'd seen the bit of luminous white, Tony bl uh, barely turned his head and used his peripheral vision to check out what he'd gotten had gotten his attention, and as he'd expected, he spotted Glamrock Freddy. The animatronic was pacing Tony three feet or so behind Tony's right shoulder. It looked like Glamrock Freddy was shadowing Tony, but why? Tony's heart stuttered. What if Glamrock Freddy had seen Tony go into or come out of the kiosk? He could have. The stage where the band had been playing was very close to the kiosk. Had the band been playing when Tony had come out? He couldn't remember. He'd been too focused on getting clear, out, clear of the kiosk. Maybe it was just a coincidence that Glamrock Freddy was walking in the same direction Tony was going, just a few feet from Tony. Tony risked another glance at the animatronic. He quickly looked straight forward again. Nope, not a coincidence. Freddy was clearly focused on Tony. Were the animatronics programmed for security as well as entertainment? Would Freddy res report Tony to someone or confront Tony himself? Tony picked up his pace. He practically ran through the crowd until he reached the Fazcade. Then he shot down the nearest aisle and ducked behind a shooting game. His heart beating even louder than the noisy games around him, Tony waited for several seconds. When nothing happened, he eased his head out from behind the game. He looked around. Glamrock Freddy was nowhere in sight. Even so, Tony waited another full minute. Finally, his palms sweaty and his pulse churring in his eyes, uh, in his ears, sorry, Tony went to find his friends. Tony pondered what he'd discovered the whole rest of the afternoon and evening. By 10pm, however, when it was time to get Morrigan 99's PM, Tony was no closer to figuring out what GGY was up to. Maybe Morrigan 99 would have some answers. Logging into the forum he hoped was the right one, Tony checked for private messages, and sure enough, he'd gotten one from Morrigan 99. Morrigan 99, what do you know? Tony frowned and typed his response. Digger 1. About what? Morrigan 99. Don't be dense. GGY. Tony uh, wiggled his fingers. What should he do? Refuse to say or be truthful? He decided to go for a truth. He typed. Digger 1. GGY has a hacked Pizzaplex play pass. They can go anywhere in the Pizzaplex. I want to know why they're doing that. Morrigan 99. Not bad for a little kid. Tony's breath caught. His fingers trembled above his laptop keyboard. How did Morrigan 99 know he was a kid? Morrigan 99. I know who you are. You're playing with fire. Digger 1. Who are you? Morgan 99. Meet me in 30 minutes, under the south side bleachers at the high school. Tony started to type a response, but Morgan 99 logged out of the forum. Tony stared at his screen, then he too logged out and closed his laptop. Turning his head, Tony looked out his open window. It was raining again tonight, a little harder than the night before. This time, oh sorry, this was the time of year when it rained more often than not. Tony inhaled the familiar Petricor scent of the air and watched a breeze curl up the hem of his ugly brown curtains. He really didn't want to go out in the dark and rain, but he had to. Apparently, Tony had found every investigator's dream, a source, and he wasn't about to be a coward and not take advantage of the situation. He needed to meet Morrigan 99. If he didn't, he had no business wanting to be an investigative reporter. Journalists weren't cowards. Through the thin wall that separated Tony's tiny room from his grandma's much bigger room, Tony could clearly hear the droning voice of the local nighttime newscast's anchor. His grandma's hearing wasn't great and she turned the TV up too loud, but that was good for Tony tonight. His mum was asleep by now. She always went to bed early. Tony would be able to sneak out without any problem. The high school, sprawling just outside the outskirts of town, was only a couple of miles from Tony's grandma's house. He could bike that easily, even in the pouring rain. Tony looked around his room. What should he take? Tony's gaze flittered over his meager belongings. Don't just stand there, he admonished himself. Tony forced himself into action. Reaching into his nightstand drawer, he pulled out his small flashlight. He tucked it into his jeans pocket. Then Tony went to his closet and pulled out his aluminum uh, baseball bat. I can't believe I just said aluminum. 
Although, wait, it is aluminum. Wait, al aluminium. No, there isn't an I? Is that just an American spelling, or has it never had an I after the N? I, sw like, I know the periodic table so well, I swear. Has it never had an I after the N? If so, it is aluminum. <laughs> I, 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 okay, fine. Pull out his aluminum base baseball bat. He didn't honestly think that a, ren a rendezvous near the high school bleachers was going to be dangerous, but he couldn't be sure. Why take the risk? He was going armed. Tony reached up and pulled his rain poncho off its hook behind the closet door. Tony looked around. Anything else? Just your courage, he muttered to himself. Tony dropped the poncho over his head and went to his warped oak bedroom door. He waited until he heard a burst of music from a commercial on his grandma's TV. Then he quickly tiptoed into the hallway and snuck to the stairs. Still in his stocking feet, Tony made no sound as he descended the long, narrow flight of well-worn wood treads. Skipping the second to last one because it had a loud squeak, Tony hopped onto the dark blue braided rug in the entryway. Yeah. He grabbed his shoes from under the scarred bench of his grandma's rickety coat rack and pulled them on. Then he let himself out into the barely moonlit night. Why wouldn't why couldn't I collect stamps for a hobby? Tony asked himself as the rain started pelting the hood of his poncho. At least it was a warm rain. Tony reminded himself that he couldn't melt as he retrieved his bike from the shed behind the house. Then, tucking his baseball bat under his arm, he pedalled down the driveway to the road that led to town. Santa Claus is coming to town. Oh yeah! <laughs> By the time Tony reached the edge of the athletic fields at the high school, he was not only drenched, he was also thoroughly spooked. He, wa he really wanted to turn around and ride back home as fast as he could, but he didn't. Tony got off his bike and leaned it against the darkened light post. His breath coming in tense little gasps, he grasped his baseball bat and surveyed his surroundings. Tony and his friends had been to several high school football games. In just a couple years, they'd be attending this school. They liked pretending that they already did. On game nights, the football field and the bleachers area were lit up by massive banks of spotlights. Between the lights and the crowds, this corner of the school grounds always felt alive and exciting. The area didn't feel that way now. Tonight, the hundred yards of artificial turf Barely illuminated by a, a very uh, sorry, barely illuminated by a few weak security lights at the edges, looked like a vast pool filled with murky water, or maybe quicksand. Tony felt like if he were able to step out onto that field, it would suck him down into it, pulling him out of this reality and into another one. Tony exhaled loudly. Get a grip, he told himself. Tony did a 360 degree turn, staring hard as fast as he could, st staring hard as far as he could see. He listened even harder. The rain rapped and tapped as a staccato rhythm on Tony's poncho, and at first he could hear a little else but the water's incessant beat. But then, behind Tony, something clanked near the bleachers. Tony spun toward the sound and tried to see into the dark shadows tucked inside the steady rain. He could barely see the rising outline of the aluminum stands. Um... Yeah, uh, he squinted, searching the area where he thought the noise had originated. Get over here. A girl's voice called out. A girl? Of course, a girl. Idiot, Tony thought. Morrigan was an Irish goddess. Oh my god, I called it. I freaking called it. Uh, or three of them, depending on which myth you read. Of course, Morrigan 99 was a girl. <laughs> Come on, the girl called. I won't bite you. And if you try, you can whack me with that bat. And if I try, you can whack me with that bat. Tony let the bat hang nonchalantly loose but also at the ready, as he trotted toward the bleachers. Rain blew in under the hood of his poncho. He swiped it from his eyes. He blinked to clear his vision. Over here, the girl called. The smooth voice sounded like its owner, had an overabundance of attitude. Something about the voice was familiar, but that was probably because Tony knew so many girls with attitude. Tony slowed and took a couple more tentative steps forward, in seconds, he was under one of the uh, bleacher benches, listening to the rain's tinkling patter on the metal above him. Even over the rain's racket, he heard a rustling. Then the murk to his left shifted. A figure in black rain parka stepped up to Tony. The figure lifted both hands. Tony tightened his grip on the baseball bat. The parka's hood fell back. Tony found himself looking into the dark eyes of a girl with long black braid. It was the girl from the arcade. It's you. 
Tony said. He felt like an idiot as soon as the words were out of his mouth. He tried to recover. Crystal, right? You talk to Axel, Crystal said. You never told us your name. Tony. Tony blurted out before he could remember he was supposed to use his nom de plume. <laughs> okay, Tony, Crystal said. Rain trickled down from Crystal's Parker hood and coursed over her pretty face. She didn't wipe it away. How did you know it was me in the forum? Tony asked. You're not as stealthy as you think. You're literally the only person going around asking about Gigi Why? Why did you meet me? Tony realised. He still had a death grip on his baseball bat. He relaxed his hands and let the bat hang at his side. Crystal glanced at the bat and smirked. Then her expression turned serious. I wanted to meet you because I think you might be sticking your nose into something that could get you into trouble, Crystal said. All I'm trying to find out is who Gigi Y is, Tony said. Exactly, Crystal said. And I don't think that's a great idea. Why? Tony asked. Crystal poked Tony in the chest. Use your brain, kid! You said yourself, in your PM, that Gigi Y has hacked a play pass. Do you think that's just for kicks? Tony frowned. I figured. He stopped. He wasn't sure what he figured. Crystal stepped closer, so close that Tony could smell her breath. She'd recently eaten something chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something, Crystal said. And if I find out you've told someone else, that baseball bat won't protect you. Tony invol involuntarily tightened his grip on the bat again. Okay, he said. He cringed when his voice cracked in the middle of the word. Crystal leaned in close and stared into Tony's eyes. Apparently satisfied, she nodded. My hobby, she said, which I do for the fun of it, is hacking. I like to poke around and see what there is to see. Like Gigi, why? Tony said. Not like Gigi, why? Crystal snapped. I look around. Gigi, why? Has another agenda. What's that? Crystal shook her head. That's the thing. I don't know. All I know is that they're doing things that are weird. And when I say weird, I say it's, it's unpredictable. And unpredictable can be dangerous. What weird things? Tony asked. Crystal glanced over her shoulder. When she studied the blackness around them, it felt like spiders were sk skittering down Tony's spine. He ignored the instinct to shift his feet and look over his shoulder too. One of the things I was poking into, Crystal said when she returned her gaze to Tony, was the Pizzaplex animatronics code. I was curious about how their behaviours were chosen, just for fun. But then, when I was looking at the code, I spotted some strange lines that didn't seem original to the programming. The new lines of code created additional conversations, behaviours, and Glamrock Freddy, Chica, Roxy, Monty, stuff that wasn't in the legitimate coding. Embedded in those lines of code are seemingly random G's and Y's. Tony felt that little clutch in his stomach that always happened when it seemed like he was onto something. Don't programmers sometimes, like, leave a breadcrumb trail? Like a signature? He asked. Crystal nodded. That's exactly what they do. Or at least I do. And this signature is one left by a hacker, not by one of the original programmers. I'm sure of it. G's and Y's, Tony repeated. I don't believe in con coincidences, Crystal said. Me neither, Tony said. Crystal reached out and grabbed Tony's arm. He had to stifle a, gra a gasp, sorry. For some reason, GGY wants to control the animatronics in very specific ways, Crystal said. I don't know why, and I don't know what the code is designed to do, she shrugged. I didn't think much about it when I found it, and I really didn't care until you started asking about GGY. That's when I linked what I found in the code to GGY on the high scorers rosters. And she shrugged. I don't know. I just felt like I should tell you. Twice, when I've been at the pizza plex poking around, Tony blurted, I caught Glamrock Freddy watching me. Crystal bit her lip. You need to be careful, she said. But why? Tony began. Crystal shook her head. None of it is my business. I repeat, I don't care. So, I'm going to forget about all of it. But, she rolled her eyes and sighed dramatically. I have a little brother, and I would have felt like a jerk if I didn't tell you what I know and warn you to be careful. She raised her hood. Now I've done that. Without saying anything else, Crystal stepped backward 
and disappeared into the gloom. Tony gripped his baseball bat and turned to dash toward his bike. <laughs>